Hi everybody, uh, my name is Simon Kostouris and I'm the CEO of AC3 and today we'll be talking about serverless computing and data lakes. Just before we get started, I wanted to say how incredibly proud we are to be sponsoring as a gold sponsor this week at Summit and also to be hosting this event. Um, it's been great to be able to connect with, the, with our customers and with the broader ecosystem uh, at AWS. We've gained a lot of great insights and uh, taking a lot away this week back to business and back to our customers. Now, just before I get started, I want to um, kind of talk to you guys a little bit about AC3. Um, if you guys don't know uh, who we are, you may better know us as Bulletproof. Uh, last year in June, AC3 acquired Bulletproof, and since then we've uh, integrated the Bulletproof business inside of AC3, uh, and we've been working hard to uh, represent ourselves as a new brand in the market. Um, as an organisation, we have about uh, 250 people and we're spread across Australia and New Zealand uh, and our remit is really a secure uh, managed services provider and a lot of that's done on, on AWS. Now with that I'm going to introduce um, Adrian White to the stage. Adrian is from uh, New South Wales uh, Department of Spatial Services uh, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about spatial services themselves and also the business challenge that uh, we helped um, resolve. So with that I'll invite Adrian. Uh, once Adrian comes up, uh, Greg will come up thereafter to talk about the technical challenges and what we've done in the technical space to, to fix. So thanks guys. Just the flicker. Thank you Simon. It's really great to be here today to share with you the journey that we've been on in partnership with AC3. Uh, Spatial Services is the uh, New South Wales government agency responsible for maintaining foundation spatial data right across the state. Foundation spatial data is kind of the core ingredients that you need if you want to um, deliver any sort of mapping application or undertake any sort of geospatial analytics. They include information like administrative boundaries, suburbs, local government areas, geocoded addresses for every single property in the state, and other data sets like imagery, elevation models, and even high-precision GPS correction services to get your positioning down to two centimeters. As an organization, we've evolved from, I guess in our origins, functioning around the production and printing of paper topographic maps. And today, we find ourselves delivering cutting-edge spatial data products and services right across government and industry. The project that we're showcasing today relates to the digital cadaster, one of, if not the most important foundation spatial data sets that we provide for the state. The digital cadaster represents all the parcels of land across the state and the location of their boundaries. So here's a little snapshot. You can see um, uh, those boundaries in yellow overlaid over the imagery. Now, this data set it's one of the largest in the world, and it's the result of stitching together over 4 million parcels of land together. It's kind of like the hardest jigsaw puzzle you could ever imagine, and not all the pieces fit together properly. So we've had significant challenges in developing our capabilities to date, and obviously those challenges are continuing to evolve. And the area that I'll speak about next particularly relates to the change process. This data set is undergoing continual change, as land is progressively subdivided across the state, as more and uh, more people uh, uh, live in New South Wales, we need to provide uh, the housing and property su to support them. So, as a data set, the cadaster doesn't necessarily represent physical objects on the ground. It really represents the legal status of property ownership across the state. But for spatial services, in order to meet the needs of our clients, we actually need to have a better understanding and prevent, present information much earlier to support the needs of our stakeholders. So before the, uh, we update the digital cadaster with new subdivisions, there's about an 18 month period of approvals. The construction work that you can see here where all the roads and the infrastructure is getting created and put in place. And finally, the compliance checks at the end of the process. So if you're a local government organization, a utility service provider, or another state government agency that's involved in supporting and overseeing that development process, you really need the best information available at the earliest possible time. 
So we needed to get a bit smarter with how we do, how we provided our services, and we needed to have a framework in which we collaborate closely uh, with all of our uh, stakeholders uh, to deliver the best possible uh, solutions for them. Just, oops, I suppose, uh, honing in on those problem areas a bit more, our stakeholders needed high accuracy data. And the reason being that um, we needed to be the data provider of choice for these organizations to make sure that we had a consistent and universally adopted data set right across the state. We also needed to provide quality information about the data that we were collecting. And obviously, the expectations of quality increase as the development process um, progresses through its various stages. One important aspect was the whole way through the solution development, we needed to keep our primary focus on the user needs. The user needed to be able to get the information that they needed at the point that they needed it and present it to them in a way that was meaningful to them. And that's not consistent if you think about the types of development that occurs in uh, inner city locations versus uh, greenfield development areas versus regional locations. We needed to be able to adapt to those different needs. We needed to be able to automate our services as much as possible. We already had overstretched resources, so if we were going to increase by an order of magnitude the amount of information we're processing, we needed to find smarter ways to do that. And finally, we needed to be extensible. We needed the solution to be able to be extended easily over time to continue to meet the needs of our uh, customers. And furthermore, we wanted to be able to repurpose components and capabilities in that solution to other parts of the business as we continued to transition across from our, I guess, traditional capabilities. Just talking about that a bit more, we had on our horizon that you know, we were no longer going to be maintaining our own data center. We knew that we couldn't continue to, um, I, I guess, maintain the overheads um, for internal, in-house, bespoke systems. And we also, looking at the problem area here, knew that the traditional approach to project management wasn't going to work here. We couldn't use a waterfall approach. So this is where, in partnering with, with AC3, we were able to bring together our specialist spatial skills and their advanced cloud technology capabilities to develop an innovative solution through an agile approach. And that agile approach meant that we could structure our delivery in sprints. We could sort of hone in on particular components of the scope and deal with those challenges at hand. And that's produced some really fantastic results. And I'm really looking forward to sharing those with you in a minute. But first, I'm going to hand over to uh, Greg, who's going to lift the hood and tell a bit more about how we did it. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so I remember sitting with you and, and the team uh, early on in the piece during the workshops. And we kind of had, um, I, I, had an, I had a moment where I had a real relationship. And I'm sure you're all been in a very similar position in the past. Um, you've, you've kind of been in that position where you're doing some renovations on your house or, or you're building your house and you put your development application into, into council. And, and you're not really sure. Like, you're waiting for that to, the approval to come through, and you're not really sure. Now think about that from a developer's perspective, right? That that is their that is their source of money. So so time for them and accuracy is really important. So we've got um, these applications. They're 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 a plan. They're a drawing of some sort, and they come in an image format uh, known as GeoTIFF. So it's just a TIFF as you look uh, as you expect. But it's got some geospatial information as well. So that has to go off to a third-party service, and it gets converted into what's known as Land XML. Now, Land XML comes in, and it has to go through uh, a bunch of validations to make sure that it's, it's something that is valid and can be actually used um, by the digital cadaster database that Adrian mentioned. What we found during the um, workshop phase was that there was three ways that these uh, Land XML files got uh, validated. There was three different code bases in use. There was a Java one, a .NET one, and a Python one. After evaluating uh, these 
these code bases, we decided that, that Python was the language of choice. At the time, we also didn't have um, .NET available in, in Lambda, because Lambda was probably going to be the choice. And also another thing that we had to kind of take into consideration was that the, the startup time of Java is kind of a little bit slow in Lambda, and we, we wanted to make sure that this was a fast process. So we have a number of these validations. And we wanted to make sure that they were done very fast. So what we did was we decided to use step functions, which means we could run a whole bunch of Lambda processes in parallel. Now, to make sure that this, this process wasn't too arduous, we built a very simple um, wrapper in Python that meant that we could pick up the existing function without too much change and plop it into the middle of it. This allowed us to move very rapidly and, and But though we did face a couple of challenges, and one of them uh, I'll explain. So when we kick off the step function, uh, we do a very simple first validation, which is, is this an XML file, right? Something very simple. We just load it in, and does it complete, yes or no? From there, uh, we kind of make sure that it adheres to the current schema. And then there's some uh, other validations that kick off. One, for example, is to actually draw the polygons that are represented in that land XML. And that is a representation of um, your parcel of land. So think about your, your house, and you've got a boundary uh, on your property. You don't want to have that open, right? You don't want to have your boundary kind of leaking out, and where does it start or stop? So one of those validations uh, actually kind of renders that. And that required us to put in a whole bunch of geospatial libraries into the Lambda package. And the problem that we faced here was those shared objects were really big, right? So all the shared objects and, and everything that associated with them actually blew out the size of the package. Lambda has a limitation on, on the size that you can actually um, uh, upload and, and execute on. And we had to understand and, and pull those um, shared objects apart and, and, and make sure that it fitted. We got there eventually, and, and that kind of allowed us to, to, to do all of those various geospatial validations. Now, so not only are we running the validations in parallel inside of the step function, also think about that when another file gets uploaded, we can kick off another validation process as another step function and another one and another one. That means that the, the whole system is very scalable. This resulted in a reduced time for validations and a faster feedback service. Because all of the validations were running as individual pockets of, of um, code, it also meant that we were able to store information about that validation and provide meaningful outcomes to different people, right? So a developer might be interested in various validations at different, different phases of the project. But, but the council is probably more interested is did the whole thing um, succeed or not? So we needed to make this available to everybody, right? So we needed to make, we decided that we needed to make a, a RESTful API. So we chose API Gateway to do that. We can define API Gateway using a, a Swagger or an open API document. And we can also produce, pr provide that same document uh, to third party integrators who can then go and write applications or integrate it into existing applications. Behind API Gateway, we use DynamoDB to store metadata and, and other useful information. We also used Elasticsearch, which I'll talk about a little bit more about in a second, and Cognito for authentication. We also had to make sure that with the authentication that we had, that we could also authorize the right people to get access to the right data. So a council, for instance, needs to have access to all its data that is sitting in its authority. But a developer might have multiple applications that are sitting across several uh, councils, and they need access to that. We chose DynamoDB uh, to store uh, much of the metadata and all the rest of that sort of stuff. But what became quite apparent was that some of the queries that we didn't kind of understand right at the beginning of the process weren't able to be answered by DynamoDB alone. So we had to choose Elasticsearch to, to help us answer those types of queries. 
The way we populated Elasticsearch was by using a DynamoDB streams. So all of this uh, allowed the, the, big, the greater team, uh, ourselves, uh, and the special services team to, to build three applications during the project. We built a very simple um, CLI, that, that, you know, a reference type CLI, as well as a, a web front end. But of real interest is the web feature that service that we built. This meant that you could use ArcGIS or QGIS desktop software, and you could actually get that information in a visual representation. I'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a second. So we needed to, to make all of this automated. And it was quite interesting that um, right back at the beginning of the project, we, we got an opportunity to walk around the, the, the floor out at Spatial Services in Bathurst and kind of see the people actually in action using this stuff. And it was really interesting to see what they were doing, right? They, they would get an email in, and they would be storing information in a spreadsheet. And, and we identified a, a, a number of flows that these people were using. And from there, we decided that you know, we could notify them instead of having them actually manually keeping track of those sort of things. So think about them, them getting notifications or when a status uh, had changed on a document, or maybe if an SLA was about to be breached or had been breached. This also meant that we could uh, provide you know, queries, right? So think about this. A, a, a developer wanted to find out where their, their document was in the process, and, and that had meant an email right, coming in. So with the API, they were now able to query that and get in instant information as to where they were in that process. This allowed for a smoother process for everybody. And also through the use of uh, SQS, we actually built a little system that was able to automatically upload that into the digital cadastre database at the right time. So earlier, I talked about um, building the RESTful API. And we built those three applications. And it's quite interesting that the web feature service is a cutting edge Open Geospatial Consortium compliant system. And that replaces something that has traditionally been um, sold by GeoServer or ArcGIS. And it means you can, you can use any desktop GIS software. We believe that this is the only service in the world that is serverless today. Not only did we solve um, for the problem outside, we also wanted to make sure as a team that the system could be uh, growing, had features added to, and, and you know, any problems could be fixed easily. So we built a code pipeline. We built in unit tests into the REST API uh, functions, as well as all of the validation functions. We also built pardon me, integration tests into the process as well. This meant that you could go from dev test into deployment in a very safe and automated fashion. I'll now hand back to Adrian, who will take us through um, what this means to the team now and what the future holds. Thank you, you Greg. To, I think you might need to click twice. So as a solution, this has certainly been a huge step in our capabilities in terms of what we can deliver to our clients. Not only in terms of the amount of information we can process, our, it's also about our ability to assess its quality and also to improve efficiency right across our organization. So in terms of the amount of plans or subdivisions that we can process in any one day, we've been able to increase that by an order of magnitude without having to um, I suppose, try and replicate the manual processes that we might have had to use in the past. We've also consolidated down all those validation tests so that all the information about quality that we need to assess a particular set of cadastral data is available in one place. And for us and for the users of our information, the efficiencies that we've gained means that uh, local government, utility organisations and the general public can access information about new subdivisions up to two days faster than they were previously. 
I think one other key aspect um, looking back at the project is that there was also a significant amount of knowledge transfer that occurred between AC3 and our organization. And one of the outcomes that uh, we like to achieve when we, when we undertake these types of uh, engagements is to make sure that our staff are upskilled and I can now happily say that we're in a position and are continuing to provide incremental and regular improvements to these services. Not only that, we're able to repurpose components of what's been built into other business areas to ensure that we're getting maximum benefit out of this and also further uh, integrating those, those skills and capabilities across the organisation. And I suppose, um, uh, from my point of view, it really means that we're not committing resources to keeping the wheels running, we're actually keeping, uh, dedicating resources to further improving the products and services that we offer our customers and the community. So what we really delivered was what our stakeholders termed a cadaster as a service. Now, this is kind of like a whole business uh, service as well as all the technical components packaged up to make things really easy for our stakeholders and to drive efficiencies within their organizations. One example of this is within our own internal business team. What you can see on the screen here at a high level is a process which we follow to update the digital cadastral database with new subdivision information. We get inputs from a data custodian that may include things like a notification, the image itself, the TIFF image, and also perhaps some intelligent digital data called LandXML that Greg referred to. We don't necessarily receive all of these, and we can receive them in different sequences. So our workflows need to be ha able to handle lots of different scenarios. Where needed, we can tap into an external service provider that we've engaged through a 24-hour SLA to turn around those TIFF raster images into intelligent digital data. And then finally, provide that information to our team members to ingest into the digital cadaster as efficiently as possible. Now, all of this is tied together with automated cloud-based workflows, which means that we're a much more streamlined organization. For local government, a cadaster as a service means the ability to visualize subdivision information on demand much earlier than they were previously able to. So for example, here you've got a fairly large subdivision, the new roads in green, the lots in uh, parcels of land getting created in brown, and you can see that it's overlaid over a new development area. Now what this meant, has meant for local government is the ability to visually track the delivery of new housing. It means that they can interactively and concurrently assess subdivision information across multiple business units at once. And in some cases, it's meant because they can work in advance, they can deliver services to the community for new properties up to two weeks earlier than they were previously able to. It also means that the specialist staff that support their spatial systems are now no longer tied up with data entry, but can now focus on further improving the services and capabilities across the organization. For spatial services as a whole, a cadastre as a service means an underpinning capability to transition our data sets from two-dimensional, which is all we need if we're just going to print uh, paper maps in the past, to now transitioning to providing 4D foundation spatial data. So not, not only are we visualizing information in 3D, but we can actually visualize it at any point in time. Now, what you're seeing on the screen here is some representation of some strata lots in Penrith. Almost 50% of the new parcels getting created in New South Wales today are strata lots. So it's really important that we can visualize that information easily. And it's really valuable for service delivery, planning, and a whole range of other applications. The move to 4D foundation spatial data also ties into new applications that are emerging. Things like digital twins, augmented reality, and even autonomous vehicles. 2D information just isn't enough. So we need to have a massive upheaval of our capabilities and the products and services that we provide. Finally, a cadastre as a service means a cap uh, uh, an ability to provide metrics on the stocks and flows of the property development process for how we create new parcels of land. Contributing to 
the identification of pain points in that process, but also um, the ability to provide data analytics, data analytics and business intelligence capabilities to government and industry, driving improvements in reform uh, and regulation to unlock the delivery of housings and have a positive in influence on supply um, and affordability. So we're pretty excited about where the future is going to take us with this project and um, uh, really pleased to have been a part of today to share this with you. But I'll just hand back to Greg to, uh, to wrap up the presentation. Thanks again, Adrian. Uh, the, the stuff in the future looks, looks really amazing. I can't wait to see it come to fruition. Uh, so just in summary, um, spatial services faced a number of opportunities, right? We had potentially inaccurate data. There was closed and manual systems. It was potentially error prone. And they had indirect communications. So AC3 provided innovation through a more accurate information with the validation process. It's complete and very comprehensive today. We provide uh, user centricity right, by making that open data with that RESTful API and that Swagger document able to be available to everybody to do integrations with. We automated not only the process of Doc, of the, the, the document flow, but also of the deployment of the system. We also made the system extensible. So what does this all mean? It means we can now process 500 plans per day, utilizing 250 plus validation tests and we can process them two days faster. If you'd like to uh, come and find out more, or if you have any questions, please come and visit us at our booth, C6, in the uh, city future uh, area. And we also have a couple of games where you can win a $500 voucher if you feel interested. Uh, you can also play rock, paper, scissors. And also, if you'd like to fill out the um, survey at the end, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much.